There it goes. Okay, so we went up through um, wrist last week. So we've got to go all the way through, not just humerus, but uh, shoulder as well this week. If I don't get to everything, a couple of things um, I'll record and push, put it on uh, on canvas. But also, I, I don't know if y'all knew what these videos were. Uh, I looked at the analytics and it doesn't look like they've been accessed all that much. Um, but you've got some ASRT videos. I'll show you these so you know exactly what they are. two bones, you've got the radius and ulna, and uh, both articulate with the humerus in different ways. Um, the radius is the bone on the thumb side, so, you know, you're trained to be an RT, so word association, thumb, radius, same side. And uh, remember, too, that this is from anatomical position, so whenever we're talking about thumb side, we're talking about anatomical position that would be on the lateral side, as opposed to the radius being on the medial side. So, individual anatomy on the ulna, what you've got is the electronon process, and the electronon process is what articulates and gives you the flexion and extension motion. So, uh, the electronon process is what receives the distal end of the humerus, um, the, the condyles on the humerus, so you can flex and extend your, your elbow. Coronoid process is the most anterior portion of that. And what we're looking at in the coronoid process is this little projection right, uh, let me tap it right here on the very most anterior portion. That little thing right there, it, if you could, couldn't see the shadow, it's uh, right on the anterior side. Um, the styloid process is on the distal end. You got a styloid process, if you remember from the the wrist lecture, you got a styloid process on both the, the radius and the ulna. So radial anatomy, you've got the radial head, and that's what enables you to supinate and pronate. So you got the rotation here on the radial side as opposed to flexion and extension on the ulnar side. Then the radial tub tuberosity is this thing right here. It's this little bulge right here. Now on the, the test, I, I don't remember if this question is still on the test. Uh, but you need to pay attention to the, to the question. It's a line drawing of the elbow. And I think it asks about this bulge right here. And if it's a line drawing, you know, it's, it's tough to tell which line belongs to which thing, you know. Uh, 
because it's going to show you the entire ulna, but it's also going to show you this thing right there that looks like an indentation into the ulna, and in fact, what it is is radial tuberosity. Okay, so follow the lines from below, and you can kind of uh, make it out a little bit better. In years past, that's been an issue on the test, um, so just pay attention to that. So the elbow. <sighs> The joint itself is uh, made up of the proximal radial ulnar joint, it's the joint between the, the radius and the ulna, as well as the humeral ulna joint, which is the joint space between the humerus and the ulna, and the humeral radial joint. So you've got three bones going together to enable both the flexion and extension plus the, the rotation for supination and pronation. Supination, remember, is if you were laying down and looking up, that would be supination. So it's, it's with the anterior surface up. Pronation would be with the anterior surface down. So <clears throat> three joints enclosed in a, a single capsule. The uh, humerus is the big bone in the upper portion. You know, a lot of people say, well, I hit my funny bone. They think that's, you know, the humerus, you actually bumped your humerus. That's not. Your funny bone really isn't your bone, you just stimulated a nerve in a, in a particular way. Um, you might have mashed the nerve up against the bone, but it isn't that you, you know, tickled your funny bone. That's not your humerus. So the head articulates with the scapula to form the uh, shoulder joint. The distal end forms the elbow joint. So we just talked about the elbow joint. Uh, the, the proximal end is, is the ball portion of the ball and socket joint. That's your shoulder. So getting a little deeper into it, we've got the head, and the head is what articulates with the scapula, so the head is that rounded big condyle thing there. And then you've got the anatomical neck, which is just below the head. you got the surgical neck, which is just below that. And then we've got the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. So the greater tubercle is this big wad that's out here on the, the lateral side. So if you're in anatomical position, palm facing forward, your, your uh, greater tubercle is projected out laterally, so it's in profile laterally. Um, and you can feel if you mash hard enough on your shoulder and you internally and externally rotate, and you kind of feel a, a little bit of a, a, a bulge there. Some of that bulge is just musculature, but if you mash hard enough, you can actually feel the greater tubercle moving back and forth. Um, so anytime you've got something that's labeled as so specific as being greater, then you're naturally going to have less purple. Okay, so an anatomical position, what you're going to see, this would be the, the left humerus, uh, is the greater tubercle out laterally. It's in profile laterally. When you supinate, internally rotate, what you're going to see is the lesser tubercle medially. Okay, so uh, lateral, uh, the uh, with lateral rotation or, or in anatomical position, you'll see the greater tubercle uh, laterally, and then internal rotation, you see where you see the, the lesser tubercle. So we'll talk about that again whenever we get to the um, positioning. So in this limb, what we've got is medial condyle, we've got a lateral condyle, we've got a medial epicondyle, and a lateral epicondyle. So the condyles themselves, we're going to call something specific. So again, we're going to use um, some word association and the condyles themselves, the articular surfaces themselves, are what we call the trochlea and the capitulum. So the trochlea and the capitulum articulate with the bones of the forearm. All right. So how are you going to keep these two straight? You got to memorize the words trochlea and, and capitulum. But how you're going to keep them straight is this. All right. So. In front of your car, the thing that keeps your car cool is filled with water, or antifreeze, or whatever you got in it. Hopefully, antifreeze, because winter's coming. But uh, it's got this thing on top. What do you call that? What do you call the thing that keeps your car cool, first off? Coolant. Uh, the stuff inside is the coolant. But what do you call the, the apparatus that the coolant's in? Radiator. Radiator. It's a radiator. So you take that little thing off the top to add more coolant to it. What do you call the thing you take off top? Cap. The cap. So radiator cap is where you put coolant, right? So which one of the bones of the forearm sounds like radiator? 
Radius, right. So the radius articulates with the capitulum, radiator cap, okay? So if you can remember radiator cap, the other two go together. If you memorize the words, then you know you, you come up with trochlea articulates with the ulna. Exactly, the ulna, but specifically what portion of the ulna that would be the electron process. Okay? So these are your uh, condyles, and then the epicondyles are, are the things that you can feel on your elbows to knots out medially and laterally. Okay? So the epicondyle is very important for positioning. We'll talk about that here in a bit. We've got a coronoid fossa, and a coronoid fossa is what receives the coronoid process. So you've got this little indentation on the anterior portion of your humerus so that whenever you really, really flex, I don't know if you can see this or not, but when I really bend this thing up, the coronoid process here folds into the coronoid fossa. It's a fossa to receive the coronoid process. Therefore, it is the coronoid fossa, okay? Likewise, on the back side, whenever you, you extend your elbow, um, you've got a, a fossa on the back side, so that when you extend the elbow, the electronon process folds into a fossa on the back side. It's a fossa to, to receive the electronon process, and therefore it is the electronon fossa, okay? Probably the most complicated um, anatomy we're going to talk about today. Okay, so prepar uh, patient preparation is kind of similar to what we talked about on Friday, or not on Friday, Monday of last week. Patient preparation, anything can come off the patient needs to come off the patient, but if you're looking at splints or casting material or something like that, somebody else needs to take that off. Uh, the ER doctor or the radiologist or the ordering physician needs to come along and take that off. Um, general patient position uh, also follows the same rules. Uh, if you don't have to put the patient on the table, then don't. You know, if it's a walkie-talkie patient that, that can move pretty well, there's really no reason to put that patient on the table. So don't, you know, tabletop. If they're already on a stretcher, it gets a little bit difficult whenever we're, we're talking about laterals, but you can still um, perform, you know, elbows and forearms and even a humerus with patient on the uh, on the stretcher. So image receptor size. What was the the general rule for image receptor size when you could select different size image receptors? Smallest as possible. Smallest as possible. Um, the radiation size, though, is what. Field size is always going to be never to exceed the size of the image receptor, but you want to collimate to the size of the anatomy, right? In most cases, we're going to use a 40 inch SID. Um, there are cases in the shoulder that we'll talk about where we might want to back up to 72 inches and we'll point those out. ID markers, you use them in accordance with what the radiologist requires, radiation protection. Um, it gets a little bit dicey when we get up in, into the shoulder, but in the forearm, certainly you can put, put an apron on the patient, and the patient instructions just be still. All right, so, you know, watches, rings, bracelets, if at all possible, need to come off. Uh, sometimes rings it, uh, become difficult to take off the patient, especially when there's some upper extremity injury that causes swelling. So give them back to the patient. Alright, so let's just go through everything we just talked about. So central projections of the forearm are AP and lateral. We're not really going to do an oblique of the forearm, um, just AP and lateral. And understand that what we're talking about here is if the patient doesn't have a fracture. You're never going to get a, a true AP and a true lateral on a patient who has uh, obvious fracture of the forearm. If the patient is fractured, then what you might wind up with is an AP of the proximal with more of a PA of the distal, you know, depending on what, what position the patient's in um, and what presentation they come to you in. Um, so you're, this, this is assuming the patient doesn't have a fracture that you could possibly complicate 
by moving the patient around. So for the AP, and we want to shoot AP, uh, because in pronation, what we get are the bones become as parallel to each other as possible. Can't really demonstrate on, on the, the bony anatomy up here, but whenever you pronate, what you get is rotation. The, the ulna doesn't really move. The ulna still, you know, it's pretty stationary. But the radius crosses over the ulna about mid-shaft. So if we shoot the uh, forearm with the hand pronated, then what we're going to wind up with is uh, superimposition of the anatomy, and we don't want to do that. So to keep the anatomy parallel to each other, we want to shoot AP. Okay? So, <clears throat> seat the patient close to the end of the table, if at all possible. Put the, the uh, extremity all the way out on the uh, image receptor, making sure that you've got at least a, an inch proximal and distal of image receptor, proximal and distal to the anatomy. There's a couple of different reasons for that. One is that um, you just like, you know, what we talked about before, you've, you've got to include adjacent anatomy to make sure that you've got all the anatomy that you need to see, right? That's number one. And number two is that because of the divergence of the central ray, what you'll have is if you've got an image receptor exactly the same length as your anatomy, because of the divergence of the central ray, what we get is projection of the anatomy off of the image receptor. And what I mean by that is that the center of the central ray is most perpendicular, right? But whenever we get out into the periphery, let's see if I can just do this one hand, we get out into the periphery, what we get is angulation of the central ray so that it would project the anatomy off of the image receptor. Okay. So it's important to have an image receptor longer than the anatomy, um, plus on the proximal end, if you notice, the forearm actually extends about an inch into the humerus, so you really need a, a, a image receptor that's at least a couple of inches longer than the anatomy itself. Alright, <clears throat> so part position, uh, elbow extended, the hand supinated, Humeral epicondyles need to be equidistant, okay? The equidistant just means equal distance, okay? So equidistance from the image receptor, which means that a plane that would run through the epicondyles should be parallel to the image receptor. So both of these things need to be the, the same distance from the image receptor. Long axis of the forearm aligned uh, parallel to the image Otherwise, you get four short. Central ray, what was the general rule last week? Middle of the anatomy. And the collimation should be uh, two inches distal to the wrist joint and proximal to the elbow joint. Okay, so it should look like that. So what we've got are the carpal, bone, the, yeah, the carpal bones. We get the, the, the uh, joint spaces between the carpal and the radius and the ulna. We make sure we get plenty of humerus so that we can in, ensure that we include the, the entire electronom process. <coughs> Notice we've got superimposition on proximal end. You can't really get away from that superimposition unless we get into the lateral rotation. And we'll talk about that when we get into the, the elbow. But that's as parallel as they're going to get. Um, Whenever you're positioning for truly long bones, like your uh, radius and ulna, humerus, tip, fib, and femur, it's really important that whenever you move the patient that you support proximal and distal to the fracture. All right? So if the patient's got a mid-shaft fracture, which you can, your hand placement needs to be above and below that to pick it up. The reason for that is if you just put your hand directly under the fracture and pick it up, uh, basically the patient's got a second elbow there. Right? So if you go picking it up just one-handed right in the middle of the fracture, what it's going to do is it's going to bend. So you've got arteries, veins, and you've got nerves running down through there, plus the muscles and the tendons and everything else. And a lot of times these long bones, whenever they break, that's where we get the, the uh, spiral fractures, the bayonet fractures, um, oblique fractures, the very sharp fractures. So if you can imagine these sharp, pointy fractures, rubbing right up next to an artery, uh, what could happen? 
because that with artery, exactly. Now you got this thing, you know, really causing some damage. And if it's a compound fracture, what you could do is not only do some damage to the artery, but if the bone's sticking through the skin, it's getting bacteria, right? There's a bacteria in air. Um, depending on what the patient <coughs> fell on, there's, there's bacteria on, on what they fell on. So if, if you manipulate that fracture in any way so that the bone goes from outside to inside, then essentially what you're doing is you're introducing bacteria into the patient's body and it complicates their condition. So not only do they have compound fracture, but they've also got an infection, which it may have anyway, but um, you know, if you reduce the fracture, re fracture reduction is, is basically setting a fracture or in the case of the compound fracture, putting the, the bone back inside of the skin. And if that happens, you introduce more likelihood that the patient's gonna have an infection. So we don't wanna do that. All right, so thinking through our positioning here, we had in the AP, we had the humeral condyles parallel to the image receptor, equidistant, right? So what would be 90 degrees from that? Lateral, right. So if, if these have to be parallel, then what would they have to be to be lateral? Perpendicular, right. So not even looking at the slides, if we're basically parallel here and parallel here for a patient who can't perform it, then what are we going to do for a lateral? Perpendicular and perpendicular, right. So in our uh, lateral positioning, our lateral positioning is going to be very, very similar to a lateral elbow, which is also very, very similar to a lateral wrist. It's just the anatomy that we wanted to see. What were our steps for a lateral wrist? Or AP or a lateral wrist? What did we want all in the same plane? The entire limb. The entire limb, exactly. So positioning for an elbow and positioning forearm really the only difference between the two is central ready location and collimation. For the forearm, we need to see the entire forearm, but what we need to do is we need to get the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist all in the same plane. Put everything perpendicular to the image receptor instead of parallel. Okay, so get the patient down, they, you know, they're sitting in a chair and leaning down or standing, or not standing, but kneeling on a knee. Put everything in the same plane. Okay, thumb straight towards the sky uh, in the wrist, if, if you remember, we're slightly supinated like that, but in the forearm, we don't have to do that, okay? So our steps for a lateral forearm, put every, everything in the same plane, flex the elbow 90 degrees, turn the thumb straight up to the sky. Uh, ulnar styloid processes should be superimposed. It should be uh, perpendicular to the image receptor. The humeral uh, epicondyle should be perpendicular to the image receptor. Elbow flex 90 degrees, everything the same way. Now, sometimes you work in the ER and um, the, the ER doc will ask for um, maybe wrist, forearm, and elbow, three separate exams. And you might think, well, if I just do a forearm, I'm going to get the elbow and I'm going to get the wrist, right? And you're right, you would, but it's not ideal. And why is that? Well, because where we're putting our central ray. Uh, in the wrist, we're putting it on the wrist, right? So the <clears throat> middle of the central ray is giving us a, the, the most unobstructed and undistorted view of the wrist bones, right? But what happens when we get out in the periphery? I just messed that up. What happens when we get out to the periphery of the central ray? They get a lot, well, they, they get distorted. You know, since they're, they're not really long bones, uh, they're probably not gonna appear longer, but they're gonna appear distorted. The joint spaces are all gonna be superimposed because the angulation of the central ray is not perpendicular, okay? Same thing happens with the elbow. So as much double work as it is and an increase in radiation exposure, it seems to be for the patient, you can't just shoot an AP and lateral forearm and have that suffice for an AP and lateral wrist and an AP and lateral elbow. You got to shoot each one individually. Okay. Now some of your docs, you know, if, if you got a pediatric patient, uh, 
and uh, you know there's there's some sort of question some sometimes the doc may take kind of a a survey view use the the forearm for kind of a survey view so that he can uh, determine whether or not he needs further use but if it's an adult and, and he asks for wrist forearm elbow then you have to shoot him through okay So should look like that. <clears throat> so what you've got in the, the wrist here, you see styloid processes, but uh, the uh, radius appears much longer than the, uh, or projected much further distally than the, the ulna. You see this little round thing here? Uh, this is really a, a pretty decent view of the elbow, actually, even though this is forearm. Um, See this little round thing right here? That's really what we're going to be looking for on a, a lateral view of the elbow. And that's the superimposition of the condyles. Okay, but notice on proximal end, again, we've got some superimposition between the radial head, which this is radial head that comes up here. And then this is the ulna. So we've still got some superimposition. So to see the radial head free of superimposition, we've got to do some special things. Um, we just can't see it on an AP of the elbow or an AP AP and lateral of the elbow or AP and lateral of, of the humerus. So, elbow. We're going to do a lot of different, potentially a lot of different views of the elbow. We'll do an AP, a lateral, and positioning for the, the AP and lateral are really just like the positioning for the AP and lateral of the humerus or the, the uh, forearm. The only difference is going to be uh, central ray location and collimation. And then we've got two obliques. One is with a lateral rotation, one's with medial rotation. And then if the patient truly has some damage to the elbow, then we're gonna have to do some, uh, you know, if they say that they can't straighten their elbow out, you can't force them to. So we may have to do some special views there as well. The coil method, we're not gonna cover. Trina will cover that himself. Central projections, we got the, the um, uh, on all of these, again, we're going to have the patient seated at the end of the table, everything in the same plane, shoulder, elbow, and uh, the wrist all in the same plane. Collimation, we need about three inches proximal and distal for the elbow joint and one inch on both sides, again, to make sure that we include all the soft tissue and to make sure that uh, you know, if our collimators are off, we don't flip anatomy that we really need to see. So, AP of the elbow, everything in the same plane, elbow extended if the patient can tolerate it, hand supinated, elbow centered to the middle of the image receptor, humeral epicondyles parallel to the image receptor, which just means that they are equidistant, just like on the, the AP of the forearm. Central ray, just right to the middle of the elbow joint. So what we need to see is collimation. We're gonna have a little bit of superimposition, just like what we looked at on the, the uh, forearm, on the proximal end. Elbow joint should be as open as it can be. Uh, all the anatomy is gonna be superimposed, but you should be able to see the uh, elbow joint and the, the space in between the distal humerus and the proximal radius, but you're gonna have that superimposition on, on the ulna. No rotation, and uh, you should be able to see the trabecular marking. So it looks like that. So you can see that joint space. That would be the which condyle? It's humeral condyle that articulates with this thing. So that would be the capitulum. Very good. And so that's the radial head articulates with the capitulum. So this would be the trochlea. Very good. I was expecting some smart aleck to say the other thing. And it articulates with an electronic process. This is the the proximal end of the electronic process inside of the electronic fossa right there. And then we got superimposition. So lateral elbow, we've already talked about it. In the forearm, everything uh, in the same plane. Uh, bend the elbow to 90 degrees, place it in the center of the image receptor. Um, one thing that notes pointing out and, and talking about is if you got 
patients, sometimes patients swing a hammer for a living. Uh, they'll have these great big forearms, great big thick forearms. And what happens is an elbow, the lateral elbow is very, very important to get uh, as good as you possibly can. But let's say this is an image receptor. And if you've got a patient that's got these great big elbows, big fat elbows, and what happens is if you tell them to put their forearm on the image receptor and they got these big beefy elbows up here, or forearms up here, what they'll do is they'll put their, their forearm on the image receptor and, and kind of tilt it down like so, right? Because you told them to put their forearm on the image receptor, but because of their anatomy, they're going to have a tendency to kind of put it at an angle. So what you really need to do is you need to take a look at where the patient's condyles are, and if they've got those great big fat forearms like that, uh, have them elevate their hand a little bit, or, well, yeah, just have them elevate their hand a little bit, um, and not put it, you know, at an angle. So, uh, take a look at the patient's anatomy and have them, um, you know, put the, the humeral condyles perpendicular to the image receptor as opposed to just saying I want your arm on the image receptor. So, central raised perpendicular to the elbow joint. So all the same stuff, we've got proper collimation, uh, we want elbow joints centered to the, to the central ray. Want it in true lateral position, that's going to be demonstrated by the uh, epicondyles being superimposed, radial tuberosity facing anteriorly, radial head should be partially superimposed over the point of process, and the electronic process should be in profile. So it should look like that, okay? You know that you've got a good lateral elbow when you see this round thing right there. When they're superimposed, that's what it's going to look like. When they're not superimposed, what it's going to look like is, let's see if I can make this happen somewhere on the, on the whiteboard. You see the way it, the pin just looks round, right? If I turn, well, if I tilt it in any direction, notice you see the, the separation between the two ends of the pin. So that circle doesn't look like a circle. What it looks like is a double circle. Okay. Anytime you've got angulation in any direction, so if your shoulder's too high, what that's going to do is it's going to take those two circles and it's going to separate them this way. If again you've got somebody with big fat elbows or big fat um, forearms, it's probably going to tilt them that way. Or if for whatever reason they're tilted backwards, you know it's going to separate. So you want to see that. Now the importance of this, and this is just kind of a little bit extra, is that the elbow, you can have a lot of different fractures in the elbow and you can't see them. Uh, it's a very complicated joint because of some of the superimposition that you naturally have. You can have fractures and you'll never visualize them. So what we've got in the body are what we call fat pads. And what a fat pad is, is it's a separation between tissue types. So where we've got muscle, and uh, maybe a, a tendon or a ligament that, that goes in between them, um, you, you can see the separation of those uh, tissue types. It's kind of like, have y'all been able to spot the psoas muscles in the abdomen yet? Okay. Really, the only reason you see that is because of separation and difference in tissue types. You're looking at soft tissue, sometimes air, and um, the muscle. So you got different density levels. The same thing happens with what we call fat pads. And I didn't point them out in the wrist, but you've got them in the wrist too. And so fat pads, like you've got one here and you've got one here. And um, what the fat pads should do is follow the contour of the anatomy. So in the wrist, they should follow the contour of the wrist. And what happens is whenever you have a joint effusion, that's a collection of fluid inside the joint. You remember pleural effusion? Okay. That's a collection of fluid inside the pleural. A joint effusion is a collection of fluid inside the joint, and it could indicate more severe damage than what you can actually see. So if you've got a radial fracture, a, a uh, well, radial head fracture, let's say, you've got a fat pad, and you can't really visualize it here, but you've got a fat pad that should parallel the, the radius, okay? If it swells away from the bone, then what it indicates is that you might have a radial head fracture, even if you can't see it. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. 
right? So if if you see a, this dark line that's bulging away from a bone, that's a fat pad sign that there may be some additional damage. The elbow has three fat pads. So you got this one and you've got another one here. And if it bulges away from being parallel to the humerus, it's what we call a cell sign. It, it just pushes away from it and it looks kind of like sail on a old shipping vessel, right? But you've got a third one and it's tucked inside the electronon fossa. Okay, so these two indicate that you've there's probably a 50-50 chance you've got a fracture going on there. But this one back here is stuck inside the electronon fossa. If it comes out, you've got a fracture. And as a telltale sign, you've got a fracture. Same thing in the ribs. Um, if, if the fat pads are swelled away from the, the anatomy, it's a good indication the patient has a, a fracture. Let's see if I can bring these up. This is kind of an interesting case study because usually you don't see them this well identified. Alright, see right there? See that? You see this bulge right here? That's cell sign. That's a posterior fat pad. A posterior fat pad should be tucked inside that electron fossa. So even if if we can't see the fracture, that's a good indication the patient has a fracture, and they're going to treat it as if the patient has a fracture. Okay? Y'all notice anything else about this image? I'll leave it up there for maybe another 10 seconds before I break the thing. That's good. It's it's not, you know, it's the collimation is not all that good, right? It should be collimated right here at the central root. This whole thing should be moved right down to about there. You see, we can see both condyles separately here. So it's really not a good lateral. But because we can see this, is it worth repeating? The answer is no, because we've got everything we need to see right here. Uh, we can't see the fracture, but we can see the telltale signs we have a fracture. And the doctor, he's probably not going to cast this. And I can tell you for a fact that he put this patient in a sling and kept the patient, or told the patient to stay in a sling for like six weeks. And I, I can also tell you that this person did not stay in a sling for six weeks. They stayed in a sling for about a week. <laughs> That's what I'm wanting you to see. <laughs> Training is pretty tough. She broke her elbow and she, she wore a sling for about a week and she said, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> and she took it out of the sling. And, uh, she, uh, yeah. So don't irritate Drina. She might break your elbow. She's <laughs> tough. All right. So any questions on AP and lateral elbow, AP and lateral uh, forearm? Really both positionings are identical. It's just where you put the central ray and where you put the collimation. So, yeah. are most of the positions that we're doing kind of like all the same, in a sense? Like um, very similar, yeah. Like when we get to the humerus, mm -hmm. what do you suppose we're going to put perpendicular and, and parallel to the image receptor? Same thing that we did for the forearm, same thing that we did for the elbow. Okay. Humeral condyles. Perpendicular for the lateral, uh, parallel for the, for the AP. It's just a matter of how we get to that and where we put central ray collimation, what we're actually focusing on. And we'll get to the shoulder, totally different ball game, but for forearm, elbow, and humerus, identical. Okay. Fairly well, you know, and, and as much as the, the anatomy positioning is going to be a little bit different. Okay, so what did I say that your degree of obliquity was until I get to a point where we get to a different degree of obliquity? Four or five degrees. degrees every time. So you got two obliques, one in medial rotation, one in lateral rotation. And the purpose for the obliques of the elbow is to desuperimpose the proximal end, and that is where the radius and the ulna uh, on the AP and the lateral were superimposed. Okay. So you got two different obliques. One is lateral rotation, which would be just like positioning starts out just like an AP. But you're going to have to put some body English on the patient, so you got everything in the same plane. The, the medial oblique is easy. All you got to do is pronate the hand. The lateral oblique, you're going to have to have the patient, you know, kind of tilt around and get into that position. So in both cases, we got 40, the, the humeral 
uh, epicon dials will be 40 degrees, 45 degrees from the image receptor. One is lateral rotation. So you, you know, you, you can kind of twist their, their arm a little bit, but they're going to have to move their shoulders and they're going to have to put some body on the shot. Internal rotation, just pronate the hand and it puts the, uh, the condyles in a natural 45 degree uh, orientation. Okay? So, anybody at UT out on 271? Anybody in here? No? I think they were the only hospital that we had for a while, and I, I don't know if they still do or not, but their normal um, elbow routine was a four view elbow. Most hospitals are just going to be AP and lateral. Most hospitals that do three view are going to do AP, lateral, and external rotation. And here's why. What we see on the external rotation is, on, is the, again, the anatomy we don't see on the AP. So we've got AP here. We get superimposition on the proximal end. And if we externally rotate until the humeral condyles are parallel, Look what happens to the proximal end of the radius in the arm. Right? They separate, and you can rotate, and it doesn't show it on this, but you can rotate at 45 degrees. You very well may see through the uh, radio ulnar joint space, so that you have no superimposition there. So, in the hospitals that normally shoot obliques of the elbow, and it's just a three view, it's always going to be AP. AP lateral external rotation so that we can see that. But we, what we still don't see though is a coracoid process. So a fracture at the coracoid process, or coronoid process rather, a uh, fracture at the coronoid process um, isn't going to be visual on any of those, but it still may give us a cell sign because the anterior fat. So the external rotation is, rotation is intended to see that. Okay, can you see that? Just a little separation right there, sort of. I'll bring it out so it's magnified, but that little point right there, and the AP is tucked underneath, right? But whenever we do medial rotation, that's that's what we'll see. So that's the only thing that it shows, as opposed to the lateral rotation shows some separation, so we can see everything except for that. Okay. Central ray is going to be perpendicular to the elbow joint. And so which one is that? Uh, it says right there. I should have deleted it. <laughs> but just looking at the image, you see that point sticking out there, and you've got signif significant superimposition between the proximal radius and ulna, right? So the lateral rotation is intended to separate those two. So unless you've got, you know, if you did something really, really wrong, uh, that's not going to be lateral rotation. That's going to be medial rotation, as opposed to la ooh, ooh. lateral rotation is there. So you see the desuperimposition. You can see that tuberosity all out there by itself. You can see the uh, joint space in between them. Pretty close to seeing the, the joint space between the proximal radius and ulna. So again, medial rotation, everything's superimposed, but you get that. Lateral rotation, you don't get that, but everything else is not superimposed. Okay? Now, um, so in my experience, personal experience, um, you got two different people who've, who've got elbow injuries. Right? Some people are going to come in with their elbow bent, like so, right? and they're holding it like that. So you know that you're going to need to get an AP and a lateral. Uh, the patient may refuse to completely straighten their, their elbow out because if you've ever truly had elbow pain, you know it really hurts to, to extend it. So the patient comes to you like so. The, best thing, or the, my, my experience of the best way to go about imaging the elbow is to start, they're almost in a lateral position, right? So extend it up the shoulder out until everything's in the same plane. Try to get them to, to turn their thumb for it's pointed to the ceiling if they can. 
and go ahead and shoot your lateral. Look at your lateral. See if there's any evidence, true evidence of a, a fracture before you try to talk to the patient and straighten their elbow. So that's number one. Number two is second type of patient may come in with their elbow not bent but straight. Okay, one hundred percent of the time that I've seen a patient with an elbow not being bent is a patient with a dislocated elbow. And when the elbow dislocates, what you're gonna have is because you've got some stress on the elbow already, but if it pops out, what you're gonna have is that um, the, the elbow joint is gonna be up here, okay? So the electronic process comes out of the uh, trochlea and it's sitting up here. Now, does that sound like a good idea to take this patient and bend the elbow up? No. Absolutely not. So my recommendation is that if you have a patient with a straightened elbow, that you go ahead and shoot the AP in whatever way that they can possibly shoot it, uh, that they can you know, possibly position themselves into and look for a, a, a separation there. So look for the, uh, the distal humerus not to be articulating with the, the, the uh, ready snow, okay? But what if you've got a patient and they don't have a dislocated elbow, um, you shot the lateral, and it doesn't look like they got a fracture, you need to get an AP, but they can't straighten their, their elbow out. They say they won't straighten their elbow out. Uh, in that case, what you're gonna have to do is kind of a composite view. What you're gonna have to do is two views of the elbow for the AP. So have the patient straighten their elbow as far as they will, Try to talk them into straighten it out as far as they, you know, th as far as they can, but they're going to come to a point where they say, I, I can't straighten it out any more than that. So what you're going to have is partial flexion. And in partial flexion, you're going to have to take two views. One with the humerus parallel to the image receptor, so that you can see the distal portion of the humerus. So you shoot that one with the, this, this, with the humerus parallel to the image receptor, and you shoot a second one with the radius and the ulna parallel to the image receptor. Okay. So you're going to include the elbow joint on both of them, but what anatomy is parallel, you know, is you're, you're going to have to shoot two views with different anatomy parallel to the image receptor. And we would just have to indicate that there's partial flexion. What's that? We would just have to indicate that yeah. there's, there's partial yeah. flexion. Yeah, it, it really should be pretty obvious by the, the, uh, the, the image. What you've got here is some significant uh, distortion of the uh, uh, radius and all here. So you got partial flexion there, uh, but it would not hurt to, to go ahead and indicate, you know, right on the request or document on the image that, you know, one, which one is which, you know, partial flexion, humerus parallel, partial flexion, radius and all parallel. So none of them are, are very good looking. It's an ugly image. But you know, if a patient can't straighten their, their elbow out, that's the best you can do, right? So the only time that you do these is if the patient just absolutely refuses and they say that they cannot straighten their elbow all the way out. You would do partial flexion, two APs, so that you can see as much of the elbow joint and get a full perspective as you can. Okay? Any question on elbow? Coil is, you know, like I said, trainers can do that uh, in the sophomore year. And it's that is what it looks like. So the only other thing I'm going to add is that you might uh, work in a hospital where they'll do um, a radial series, radial head series. A radial head series is true lateral with the hand in different positions. So whenever you rotate internally, externally, you rotate that rotation comes at the radial head, right? So some of your hospitals will ask for a radial head series, and what that's gonna be is four different laterals. So with four different laterals, it's gonna be with the thumb side down, pronated, thumb side up, and as supinated as the patient can go. So that you've got four different views of the radial head and different uh, levels of rotation. You can't do that with the patient AP as well because of the superimposition over the uh, over the ulna, but they'll shoot a lateral with the, the hand in different stages of rotation. All right, so any questions on, on the elbow? 
Okay. Well, why don't we take a break? We'll come back and we'll pick up there. Humorous. <laughs>